Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries and in this video review I'm going to be looking at the Middlelands Expanded by Monkey Blood Design. So, as I say, today I'm going to be reviewing the Middlelands Expanded. If you've read my review of the original Middlelands book, you'll know that this is a setting based in a green-tinged fantasy version of medieval England, with a streak of emerald humour running through it. You'll also know that I rated the original book very highly. The first book focused in the area known, appropriately enough, as the Middlelands, the central area in this fictional version of England called Havenland in the campaign setting, whereas the Middlelands Expanded zooms out a little to focus on the rest of the Havenlands, the various small islands dotted about it, and the neighbouring countries of Scotland and the Odenwall, fantasy depictions of Scotland and Wales respectively. The Middlelands Expanded is available in PDF format from Drive Through RPG, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. I backed the extremely well-run and timely Kickstarter to get a hard copy of it. I'm not sure if it's available for general ordering yet, but I'm sure it will be at some point soon. The Midlands Expanded book is written by Glyn Seal, Edward Nagy and Mark Nolan. It's published by Monkey Blood Design and Publishing. It's a hardback, full-colour book that's about 224 pages long. If you're not familiar with the format of my reviews, I give a small capsule summary at the start, along with a rating so that people press for time and can watch this bit, and then I go into more detail about the book afterwards. My rating is broken down into four categories, and these are the writing, the look of a book, the system, and the background. Inspired by the Fate RPG, which is one of my favourites, each of these ratings gets either a plus, a minus, or a blank, depending on whether it's good, not so good, or I'm indifferent to it. The ratings are then added together to give a final score ranging from minus 4, the lowest, to plus 4, the highest. Okay, so to sum up, the Midlands Expanded has the same high standard and level of quality that I've come to expect from Monkey Blood products, and expands the same tongue-in-cheek version of England that the original book crafted so expertly, without seeming over the top. It also introduces some intriguing glimpses at the wider world. If I was going to be hypercritical, then I'd say that the glossy cover of the book doesn't really match with the matte cover of the original book. However, if that's the worst criticism I can come up with, then it should give you an idea of how excellent this book actually is. So, without further ado, let's crack on with the rating. So, for the writing of this book, I've given it a plus. It's colourful and evocative without feeling bloated or drawn out. There are so many ideas and potential adventure hooks fairly just bursting out of this book that it's difficult to read any of the pages without seeing something that could be incorporated into a game. For the look of the book, I've also given it a plus. Now, my earlier comment about the glossy cover aside, the book itself is a thing of beauty. The excellent atmospheric artwork, throughout and the beautiful cartography for which the author has received an any award is absolutely stunning and really helps bring the expanded Midlands campaign setting to life. There is also something delightfully old school about the artwork that reminded me very much of the old Warhammer Fantasy roleplay art, a comparison which is no bad thing. So, for the system, I'm going to give it a plus. Now, this is a campaign setting book, and therefore it's not particularly system heavy. However, there are a number of new monsters, spells, magic items, and other stuff in there, all using the swords and wizardry rules, making them pretty much compatible with any OSR game. I've certainly been using bits and pieces with the Lamentations of the Flame Princess rules in my Rose of Westhaven campaign, and have had absolutely no difficulty doing that whatsoever. And finally, for the rating, I'm going to give the background of the book a plus. And this is where the book really shines for me. To those of us who've spent time in the UK, it conjures up an atmosphere that is at once strange and yet also has the hint of the familiar about it. Yes, there's the alien strangeness of the moss-hued midder gloom below the surface, but there are also odd villages with their own customs, dialects and mannerisms. 
It reminds me a little bit of the strangeness of the film Wicker Man. That's the good original version, not the rubbishy Nicolas Cage version. A small, it, it really portrays this feeling of a small island full of weird superstitions and dangers, but also wonders and beauty in equal measure. So looking at that, you can see that I give the Midlands Expanded an overall rating of great. If you're looking for a setting that does for England and the UK what Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay did for medieval Europe, presenting it in all its strange and wonderful glory with a strong element of humour, but also many dangers and lurking menaces for your players to face, then the Midlands Expanded will certainly not disappoint you. Even if you don't plan to run a dedicated Midlands campaign in full, there is so much stuff packed into this book that could easily be finessed into an existing campaign that you'll still get a lot out of it. Okay, so let's get into the mainstay of the review. The inside front cover of this book has a great colour picture and map of the Rat Dog Inn, a tavern near Tealfordshire that features in the adventure at the back of the book, whilst the back inside cover has a copy of the Gloomium Randomizer chart, more on that later, and a table providing the stats for all the various monsters in the book. It's always great to see authors using these inside covers for something rather than just sticking a pretty picture or a blank page on them. The introduction to the book provides credits for the people involved or who supported the creation of the book. It also gives a handy list of acronyms for the various Midlands products that may be referred to during the following chapters. We also get some notes on why certain things were included or left out of the book. While some may not find this interesting, I always like to see the thought processes of authors writing their products. There is an explanation of the various collective terms for the different countries, featured presumably mainly for those outside the UK. But basically it comes down to England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales together are called the British Isles. The United Kingdom doesn't include Southern Ireland and Great Britain is England, Scotland and Wales. We now move on to the real meat of the book, in my opinion, the locations chapter. And this details various locations outside the area covered by the original Midlands book. We start off with a brief description of the ancient Goman roads that once ran across the country and are now a faded patchwork of dirt tracks and move into descriptions of the major forested areas in the Havenlands. It is here that the Dolman Wood, one of the forested areas on the island of Emerald, is first mentioned. The specifics of this settings version of Ireland is deliberately left vague as a placeholder for necrotic gnomes Dolman Wood setting, which I'll also put in the a link to in the description down below. I love the fact that the Midlands has done this, not only because it links together what I consider to be two great settings, but also because it echoes how many people, including myself, construct their OSR campaigns, making them out of a patchwork of various differently called materials. It's not possible for me to go into detail about all the locations listed in this book, because there are so many of them, but each of the counties in the Havenlands, and for those not from the UK, a county is basically a territorial division formed for administrative purposes. They all get a write-up, zooming in on a couple of settlements and a smattering of legends and lore. This chapter is dotted with excellent atmospheric artwork and the lovely maps that Glenn has become known and won an any award for. We also get our first look at the Serpent Lands to the north of Haven, a strange island surrounded by cliffs and ruled by snake-like humanoids, worshipping a an odd three-eyed god. The Serpent Lands are also intriguing since the colour green, which is fairly ubiquitous throughout the setting, is largely supplanted by various shades of blue. The chapter rounds off with a cool list of notable shipwrecks and a handy table for generating more. I can see these holding great potential for adventure, assuming your heroes can avoid the giant gloom crabs and defeat the jelly glooms. We then move on to a small section called Oddities, and this is a grab bag of enchanted items, spells, and my personal favourites, more details on the unique flora and fauna that exist in the Midlands. The magic items all get a small picture and a brief write-up detailing their history in the Midlands and what powers they possess, more than enough for any competent GM to incorporate them in their games. 
I was also pleased to see that the materials they were made with tied back to creatures and elements in the first Midlands book. For example, the Book of the Muculus, an evil tome of forbidden lore, is bound within the hide of a Muculus, while the Gripe Blade is a sword fashioned from the claw of a six-headed sewer gripe. We also get some tantalising hints about other elements, touched on only lightly in other books. For example, the Midium items listed tell us how Midium is a rare metallic element related to, but less dangerous than, Gloomium, found only in the deepest areas of the Midagloom. If that's not incentive to go poking around in the deeper Midagloom, I don't know what is. Following on from the oddities chapter, we have the folk chapter. And as you might have guessed from my mention of the flora and fauna a few moments ago, I love campaign setting books where they tell you about the mundane details of a setting, but do it in a way that is interesting and that brings the campaign world to life. After all, it's cool to know what powerful kings and evil monsters are doing, but it's the day-to-day -day activities and thoughts of your NPCs that really make a setting feel lived in. What the author does in this chapter is skillfully paint a picture of the common folk of the Havenlands and then follow up with a smorgasbord of sample NPCs to illustrate the different Haven folk from town guards, bear trainers and gloom bug keepers. There are a few new classes printed in the Swords and Wizardry compatible fashion, the Witchfinder, Highland Shaman and the Dragon Singer. Although I don't really go in for loads of classes in my OSR games, these are nice additions that a GM can allow or not as they see fit. The next section is the bestiary section, and it features, as you might expect, a number of different creatures, along with accompanying stats, that are designed specifically to fit in with the flavour of the Midland setting, although they could easily be used in most OSR games. Each monster gets a stat entry, providing Swords and Wizardry compatible stats, and a couple of paragraphs discussing their place in the Midlands setting. One thing notable by its absence in this book are the racial classes that feature in the bestiary section of the Midlands book. Although this makes sense since, although I can picture people playing the various goblinoid races that were detailed in the original book, playing a branch spike golem or a gloom crab might be a little bit more of a stretch. The monsters themselves are an interesting range of creatures from the from huge species of spider to the giant gloom crabs that haunt the coastal waters of the Midlands. As a fan of the Cthulhu mythos, my personal favourites are the Leviathan, a huge demonic seaborne monstrosity that lurks in the Dog Sea, destroying ships and causing tidal waves, and the tentacled horrors, amorphous seething creatures who occupy the various strata of the gloomy underground realms. There is some beautiful black and white artwork in this section, accented occasionally with Midlands appropriate splashes of green. The main section of the book then rounds off with a small adventure called the Rat Dog Inn. Focusing around the titular inn on the border of Tealfordshire, it deals with shady goings-on and the search for a missing person called Rowan Aitchison. The adventure is well written and short enough to be easily dropped into most campaigns, featuring beautifully drawn maps and some very useful tips on ramping up the weirdness and horror vibe endemic to the Midlands setting. The book rounds off with several appendices detailing new deities and beings of power worshipped throughout the Midlands, a table showing the various dukes and duchesses of the Havenlands, and a relationship table showing how they relate to each other. We also get instructions on how to use the dice drop card that comes with the book. Essentially, the Gloomium Randomizer, as it's called, is a chart you roll your dice on when in certain Gloomium hot areas to inject some additional randomness. Once you've made your roll, the chart will tell you if the Gloomium has affected it and what occurs. For example, you may find your to hit rolls boosted or your saving throws change. I think this is the only part of the book that I'm not a massive fan of, to be perfectly honest. Whilst I love dice drop charts for determining treasure and stuff like that, I don't particularly feel the need to add more randomness when you are already rolling the dice anyway, but that's just my own personal preference. We also get a graphic showing some of the signs and symbols commonly used throughout the Midlands by thieves guilds, rangers, etc, and a random table to add some additional quirks to character equipment. The section ends with probably one of my favourite random tables in the book, a table that determines the result of attempting to break in and burgle a building. 
Whilst normally I'd roleplay this stuff out, the table would be great if the burglary wasn't a central part of the session or was happening in a downtime. To conclude this review, as I said at the beginning, the Midlands Expanded continues the high quality of produce from Monkey Blood Design and is a worthy addition to the Midlands line. Also included with the Kickstarter is a gorgeous full colour map of the Havenlands. And I'll get that out now so you can have a quick look at it. Although I don't think I'll be able to fit it all on the screen since it's a fairly large map. But there you go. You can see that beautifully drawn map of the Haven Isles, which includes the areas from the original Meadowlands map, although not in quite such detail, but it literally shows you the entire country and is a great campaign map. You also get a beautifully illustrated half-sized GM screen. I'll show you that there. You can see that it has some beautiful exterior atmospheric artwork forming a panorama on the outside of it. And if we turn it around, you'll be able to see that it contains most of the importance of setting information and some of the random charts from the various Midlands products. It would be very useful to any GM who's running a Midlands campaign setting and is also a very beautiful GM screen that's just tall enough so you can still look over it and see your players without any problems. If you're a fan of the Midlands, then you should get this book. Or if you're looking for a quirky, weird horror setting to run your OSR games in, I'd advise you grab hold of a copy of the Midlands Expanded. Just beware of the mutating effects of the emerald-hued gloomium.